part of the, of the SAGE community, uh, does a lot of work in a lot of different places, certainly very interested in the notebook, but uh, I think of symbolics and plotting in addition to number theory. But, and what? And R. And R, that's right, don't forget about the, the R statistics package. But I, I think of symbolics and plotting, and so if, if you're doing calculus, you're using a lot of, uh, a lot of Carl's work and keeping that stuff as bug-free as possible. Uh, but I think uh, the prep workshop, so some of you have been in that last couple of days, and, and that was initiated last year. Uh, Jason and Carl are really the driving forces behind that, which is a great thing to have going on and, and getting some interaction with the MAA officially. But I think of, of Carl as a, as a honeybee in a field of flowers. He has got he is in on every little ticket, every little thing that's going on, and he's aware of what's happening. Yeah. So if you go and look at the track reports on activity, <laughs> if, if you look at the column on comments or edits or or, oh, yeah. or tickets visited, <laughs> Carl is other than a release manager, Carl is always at the top of that list. And, we play, and we play name that ticket. <laughs> Name that ticket. Yes. That would be a, yeah. That, we'll do that this evening. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, he's he's in on a whole lot of CC. So he's keeping track of what's going on. You know, it's it's a good thing to have Carl take notice of one of your tickets because he's going to tell somebody else about it. He's going to get you a review. He's going to plug you in with uh, something that's going on at another ticket that's relevant. So, uh, and I don't know if that's a conscious thing or a random thing that you do, but it's a, it's a great thing. All right, take it away, Carl. Thanks, Rob. I I, I can't let that go by without saying that I feel like I'm almost completely unresponsible for anything good in SAGE. Uh, there, it, it's nice to have a good overview of what's going on, and I feel like yeah, my role is more to make sure that people are able to do the things they can, but it, there's so many amazing things happening in Maxima and R and, and uh, symbolics by other people. Uh, maybe I just give it that last little push. That, that might be a little more accurate. Uh, thanks, Rob. So we're talking about elementary number theory today. Um, elementary because, of course, there's a lot of extremely non-elementary number theory uh, in SAGE in particular. Um, and so we're, we're going to talk about that. Part of this is uh, also driven by a book just like uh, Tom's talk was that I kind of constructed over the last uh, five years or so uh, in number theory and teaching this class, going from a book that I like a lot, uh, but which was not particularly interactive which is at a slightly high level sometimes for my students, and um, which kind of went in different directions than I wanted to, and I thought, well, I might as well, along with changing that, make it in SAGE, uh, so that students can really use all those things, and not just kind of have SAGE be an ancillary. And so my job today is to convince you that when you're teaching number theoretic things, and by extension lots of other things, you should think of using SAGE in an integral way, and um, not just that, but maybe, uh, Maybe to think about, you know, making it even more comprehensive, I guess. Uh, there's one thing that I don't know, and that's the, uh, the DUE grant for the utmost, uh, so I can fill in those question marks. There's more, there's, there's one for each location, so UW has one, AIM has one, so I don't Okay, know so maybe I can't fill in, I'll just keep the question mark then. Uh, but so I'm, this is partly based on stuff from the prep workshops, which has been great for uh, me and Jason developing material, which we're hoping is going to make it into the standard documentation. Uh, there's some really uh, great intros and tutorials we've tried to put together. So why stage in elementary number theory? And again, I, I want to emphasize the elementary, although I will show some somewhat non-elementary things because they're fun uh, as well. So there's a lot of places this shows up. Um, the third bullet point is, of course, the talk that Tom just gave. Uh, he did a number of things that are basically number theoretic in some sense, you know, multiplicative subgroups, U of N, right? So I mean, they, they, that's a place where it shows up. But discrete math kind of courses, um, what's more discrete than the numbers, right? Um, so you, you can have graph theory, you can have a little bit of number theory, you can have a little bit of you know, lattices or something. There's all kinds of things that go into those. Proof transitions courses often have this as a possible topic. Obviously a number theory course, not every institution has a number theory course or can offer it. The main reason we do is because I got a choice. They wanted me to add an upper level course, so we have two each semester. And I said, well, I guess I'll take number theory since algebra is already taken uh, by somebody else. But cryptography sometimes is an undergraduate course. And you'll notice that all of these things, even the abstract algebra, although that's usually at a pretty high level institution, do show up uh, in non-major courses. 
right? These liberal arts math courses, if you go and look through them, all these things and more, right? So like um, the closely related topic of um, UPCs and barcodes and things like that. By the way, the guy who invented the UPC, I guess, just passed away. It was on the AMS Facebook page um, or something like that. So they, this is hot topics. And I like to change the ISBN 13, right, uh, from ISBN 10. Any of that can show up in a non-major course. And so the interactive stuff I'm going to show you is what you should be paying attention if you're thinking along those lines. Because now we're just using sliders or just typing in different numbers in order to do math, rather than trying to do some programming stuff, which might be appropriate for an upper level mathematics course that people are expected to have uh, maybe taken a course or that they will be taking a program. Okay, of course, you might want to ask why this is useful. Let me expand the font here. Um, it's not just about big numbers in action. That's why I did it originally, is I said, how can I teach a number theory course, other than like a more method number? where I'm not showing them humongous numbers that are actually used in their web browsers and who knows where else to, to do things. Uh, so I, I really wanted to uh, make sure they saw that. Beyond that, though, number theory is wonderful because you can explore by hand. And a lot of math majors, especially at uh, smaller uh, institutions, are really motivated by the, the hands-on nature. I can find out what the value of the Mobius function is, right? I can just do it by hand. That's awesome. So Sage allows us to take that to the level of seeing it for numbers I couldn't do it by hand for. But I still have the same ethos, the same attitude about it. I really enjoy that. Um, also, I love visualizing number theory. Number theory is far more visual than we usually realize. There's lots of history of this. Um, Minkowski, in particular, uh, is a, an old example of this. Uh, but there's lots of wonderful ways to do that, and some great books uh, that can help you do that. Um, and of course, it's just learning to use a new tool. Right? Uh, I think that this is a great place to introduce students to things that they otherwise might not. So it's no surprise uh, that I would be interested in this. And of course, since Sage began life as the software for algebra and geometry exploration and algebra and geometry in the context of number theory, um, it's not a surprise that there's a lot of functionality. Don't be intimidated. We have a state-of-the-art free resource. So we should use that, right? And of course, it, it's fun. So, so that's kind of by way of introduction. And the rest of the talk is just going to show various basic topics, and then I gave you some not quite as basic topics. But I do cover them in a standard undergraduate number theory course. Um, it's not, there's a few that I don't that I'll, I'll point out along the way, that, um, just to kind of let you know what's there if you teach in a place that does have opportunity for like an analytic or algebraic number theory course. Um, and I want to highlight how I use Sage to discuss them, especially in visualizing. Um, and I have lots of interacts or sagelets, and uh, yeah, John, you should feel free to use the word sagelet as often as you want. I, I'm still not sure, because the thing is interacts, because it's kind of a weird sounding plural. And sagelet is nice, but we haven't used it as much. So maybe we need some branding. Uh, to make, BFDL has to make a decision on what the right word is. Interrupts. <laughs> All right. There it is. <laughs> Otherwise it would have been at sagelet. At sagelet. Nice. I mean the command. Very good. All right, fair enough. Okay. So the first thing that you need to know is the ring of integers module M, right? So there is certainly number theory that you can do without the ring of integers module M, but this is the place where it's easy to do stuff by hand, right? So what can you do with modular arithmetic? And this is very similar to what Tom was talking about. Um, so what I, I like to do early on in the course is to just kind of create um, a modular integer. So this mod 211, uh, for those who don't know, is creating a different kind of thing. It is no longer 2. It is 2 modulo 11. And I can see that by doing A, and I get 2. And I can see that by doing type A, and then I get something that doesn't say integer. It says integer mod. Right? So I get it's still 2, and I get integer mod. By the way, let's change this to 13, and then you'll see something. Whoa, I don't know what just happened there. There was a jump, by the way, Jason, that was not what I expected. Uh, it jumped even further than usual. And you see it gives me the least non-negative residue. Right? Least non-negative residue is of 13 is 2. So that's just what it's going to represent as. Okay? But it, it's still an equivalence class. And then I can show the students, hey, a to the 10th is 1, and a to the whatever that is, millionth or something, is also 1. Okay? So right away, I'm showing them something that's programming too. Right? I have these semicolons. And now they see, oh, it's all in one line. If I separate them by semicolons, those things will all still happen. I don't have to you know, try and make separate cells for each of these things to evaluate. At the same time, I'm also immediately exemplifying um, the syntax and 
I'm exemplifying that I can assign it to a name um, if, if you want to, right? It's not required, but it's the kind of thing that you want to do. That's the, math, uh, the, the programming side of things. The mathematical side of things is I've just verified for Ma's little theorem. The prime p equals 11 and input a equals 2. Right? 2 to the p minus 1 or 3, anything to the p minus 1 uh, is supposed to be 1 uh, for p a prime, and uh, that's exactly what I get. So you can use Sage as a calculator, but you can reinforce some programming concepts. So if that's the audience that you're reaching, students who have had that, or maybe you're interested in pursuing that, they're trying to acquire those skills for a job in the technical sector, uh, this is a great way to do it, and especially if you have a computer science department uh, that's reasonably strong, you know, you want to get that cross-registration going, right? So that's the kind of thing you, you want to think about. How, how do you attract people uh, to go between those? And I've had a number of computer science majors take it because this is one of the upper level courses they can take. They have to take one higher level math course. It can be linear algebra, it can be this, it can be numerical analysis. Um, and so they take that job. What are the prerequisites for your course? The prerequisite is only the proof transition course. And for my class, else I'll mention that later. Um, Sorry, the, the computer scientists in your school take that transition No, they take a discrete math course which is good enough for what we're, there's enough proof that they're not going to be completely overloaded. It will be a little challenging for them if they were weaker in that course, but it, some of the math students, it's also going to be challenging. So it, it's enough. The discrete course is taught by a guy who is a PhD in applied math. Um, so yeah, there, there's a Yeah, so you don't have to teach it that way. It's possible to teach a number theory course that, that introduces proof along the way. Right? So, I mean, you can modify the ideas. And, that, and this is how you should be thinking, right? Like, I'm not just giving you something you know, to you, unless you want to use my book do that. But uh, otherwise, you, know, you should be thinking, how do I modify these ideas for my context? Right? But we want to be creative here. Sage gives us an opportunity for interaction with uh, various sciences, with computer science, and uh, even you know, other disciplines. If we get more creative, like uh, psychology or something, we use our Okay, so I've verified for Maslow theorem. All right, so here's another example like this. What if I want to verify for Maslow theorem for everything? Well, I can try to loop. Again, this, this is something I actually don't do in my class very much, um, but some people would definitely want to do that. Create a loop, you can teach how do you loop, and they point out you don't even have to type 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way through 10. Hey, integer is 11. Here's a new concept mathematically, that the integers mod 11 are one concept, right? They're one object. Uh, but at the same time, I can loop through that. So for all the integers uh, from 0 to 10, I'm going to print the integer and the integer of the 10. And of course, I get 1, except for 0. And again, I've verified for Maslow theorem. Now I have proved, modulo whether the computer works, uh, that, that for Maslow theorem is true for the prime 11. Uh, so this is really nice, right? And it's handy to have later on, because now I've introduced at least the idea that I can use this in Sage as one thing. So it might work for bigger numbers. Uh, I don't want to print them all out. So instead, I'm going to give ZP a name, integer is P, and I'm going to pick a random prime. Uh, this is a little, uh, you know what? I'm not going to evaluate this because I want to make sure that some later cells have, in, have output, um, that, like, uh, well, you'll see. But I'm going to let P be a random prime. So this is a nice command. It's easy to find a lot of these commands. They're very intuitive as to how they're named, most of the number theory commands, which is not always the case. Safe, it's good. Here I do proof equals true because I want to make sure that it actually is a prime, um, not a pseudo prime uh, from some Miller Raman test. Um, anyway, you, you don't have to do that, but uh, I want to. So I name them, and then I can name the individual elements. So you see, I, I, I can teach this, this concept of programming at the same time as I'm teaching the math. And here you're seeing that things that show up in a line that's not the last line don't get printed out. Yeah. I, and ironically, I'm saying this because I don't do it now. I've chosen to go more interactive, but I know that people use Sage in a lot of different ways. Um, I also try to make it look less cluttered, um, because sometimes the worksheets can just look literally like a huge list of stuff. And I, you, know, you want it to make it a little more conversational. So here I have the prime that was the random prime that I didn't evaluate for now. So it's some crazy, almost 200 digit prime. And then I take that to the p minus 1. I take 2 to the p minus 1, and I get 1. So I verified the Maslow theorem again. And this is really powerful, because now the students see it's not just the stuff I can do by hand. It's not just some theoretical possibility. 
that there's a theorem, I proved it, I kind of believe abstractly that Fermat's little theorem works. Now, the numerical evidence is pretty overwhelming for them. That, you know, there's the, you know, for them. There's always a problem, you know, in saying that if it works for a big number, then it's true, right? Uh, but, but the point is, you also prove it, right? So you do those together, and now it kind of hits home. Uh, so this is something I really enjoy about this. Um, so I could even do it to the 400th power. Now this is not uh, necessarily going to work, because uh, 10 to the 400th is not a divisor of e minus 1. And now they can see, oh, okay, so it doesn't just always return 1 because it's trying to trick me. Uh, you know, it really computes these things. Very, very fast. And it also, if you wanted to, you could do uh, this without doing, you said you could just do 2 to the 10 to the 400 and see how long it took. Um, or whether it would ever finish. Mod 11, right? Um, I don't know, what, what do you think, William? If I did 2 to the 10 to the 400, comma 11, or mod 11? That could be 2 to the 10 to the 400? Yes. The exponent, you couldn't compute the exponent. Right, great. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Right, you'd run out of memory. I thought so. Something. I wasn't sure how big it had to be for that yeah. to happen. But this is great because I mean, then you could, you could still do the calculation, but you'd have to know you have to work modulo, you know, uh, the order of a in computing two to the right, which is of course what the computer does, yeah. right? Cause, well, because well, here a is two to, mod eleven. Right? Right. It wouldn't do that though if you take a to the and then in parentheses two to the ten to the four hundred, because the whole exponent, if you wrote it that way, That's would just right. be computed as a big integer too big to fit in the universe. That's right. So like, so William and I are saying the same thing in two different ways, which is that if you do the modular arithmetic, it does it fast and correctly. And if you try to do it any other way, it's bigger than the universe. So uh, I think that's something that has to get home to students. Right? That's, that's what number theory also is, that we can say things about these and use them to encrypt our you know, purchases. Um, here's a little interlude. Uh, you should always use tab completion. Uh, so here I, I've defined ZP. And uh, I'm not going to tag complete now because you guys have all seen that. But I'm obviously, a, I didn't evaluate it, so I'm going to get bad things that aren't very interesting. Actually, now I will evaluate it because I just want to evaluate the other ones. Oh, P not fine. Oh, here we go. And now I'll do the ZP. And so I, I can you know, tell my students, here's all the things I can do. Right? So the field. They had algebra. Some places, number theory has algebra as a prerequisite. Um, so there's lots of different things like the random element. One thing that looked kind of interesting there was zeta. So I looked at zeta, and now I used question mark to see the documentation string. This is more for the newbies to remind you that question mark is always your friend, uh, except for on the recent post on ask.stagemath.org where they want to know why print question mark didn't work in the notebook, which it does in the command line. Uh, it doesn't work, in the, presumably because it's a built-in. Um, I don't know. So, but usually it's your friend, and so here we have nth roots of unity, and so that's kind of interesting, right? So let's get some nth roots of unity. And here's where I don't want to reevaluate it, because not every prime has fifth roots of unity. Um, and so I've asked for all of them, and there they are. There's all the fifth roots of unity of some random prime uh, up to 200 digits. And uh, I create the list, and then I print out the list. And um, what's cool about this is now I can use the list comprehension notation to check that these really are fifth roots of unity. Right? So again, you, you have this thing. Now this might seem a little advanced, um, and I'm going to say in a second why this isn't as advanced as you think it is. Fifth root of unity sounds scary. Zeta, in any context, sounds scary. Uh, but it, it, this is actually a pretty basic concept that's, that's happening here. Um, but if I don't want to use uh, that, I can make an interact. And so I'm going to make an interact that will do this in a way that the students don't have to think about it. So here I have the prime is selected. This is only up to the 20th. Here are the roots, and there's the fifth power. So if I had had a little more time this morning, I could have. And I'm, the update is just for me to update the cell, because it won't update unless I do something. It would be nice to have something where I could have no input at all to an interact, and it would just update. Because I don't want to update. I just want the interact to choose a different random prime each time. Interesting. That's possible. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's possible. And probably the auto update button would sort of do that. But, I mean, if I use auto update it. equals true and I just kept on, or sorry, equals false and I kept on clicking the update button. No, there's a way to do it without any clicking at all. Um, I posted like a notebook hack of the day thing once about how to do this to make like a stop ticker or if a If you can or find something. that and email that to me or something, I'd really You make a little, use the script command to make a little JavaScript thing. So you can calls. see that a lot of primes don't have fifth roots of unity. 
pretty, um, needed, pretty amusing. You need to know the evaluate function. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So now I finally found another we stuff. One with different so Something with the day. I was going to have one every day and only did it once. <laughs> By the way, so isn't there like a bug or a documentation error day. here? Shouldn't one be a fifth root of unity? Maybe it's a primitive fifth root. It doesn't Maybe. say though. Oh, should, then that should be documented. Yeah. Right. It just says an nth root of unity, and then for all, return a list of all nth roots of one. Probably anyway, say primitive. So if somebody wants to file a ticket for that. Yeah, we'll wait on the other You just hit a, a, a nerve in this room. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, because it's a number theory error. <laughs> <laughs> it will get fixed. <laughs> this will get fixed. Okay. okay. First, a, first a ticker. Yeah. <laughs> Stunt ticker. Okay. All right. So, so the, point, it, the point is, know the level you're aiming at, right? List comprehensions could be challenging. In some contexts, it's exactly the right thing to do. You want to show your students, yes, I'm using your programming skills you've already acquired a good knowledge. Especially a school that has like an engineering program where you have to take the program early, that would be true. Our students tend to push the programming back. In my own undergraduate, I took neither statistics nor programming. Um, I, I was able to get away without having any of those things. And, uh, and unfortunately for the programming I did, not the statistics I'm glad it is. Um, but just make, make a nice thing. And even if you have a list, print it out list. So like um, Tom's thing had a lot of loops and lists, right? So if your students can parse that, that's great. I think to me that that visually gets really, really challenging to go through, right? So trying to find another way to format it is what I'm trying to convince everybody to do. Now it's a little bit of work on your end. But I think that the benefits are really manifest for the students. It really depends on the group of students who have. So here's some of the stuff I already said about what background my students have, just so that it's, it's clear. I think I said the first bullet point. Um, I do teach a little bit about groups in the class. I take one day to introduce the concept of a group. And then, of course, the most obvious example of a group, which is the additive group of integers, and, we, and a few other things. And the only thing we really need about groups is that elements have an order. That's really what we mostly use. And so we try to introduce the idea of the order of an element, and then we prove Lagrange's theorem about orders of elements. But so the order of an element is a divisor of the order of the group. And that's it. But I need that because then I save tons of time later in the course by using a much more concise language. If you've ever done index arithmetic, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? It's much easier to talk about the group of units than to do index arithmetic. At least I feel like that's the case. Um, I, and I think I learned with index arithmetic. So that's just how I do it. You don't have to. Um, and I think I basically have said all these things other than that. So. so the previous example might have seemed not elementary, but now I'm just saying, hey, it's just a fifth root of unity is just a solution to x to the fifth equals one. So what I was really doing was finding solutions to x to the fifth congruent to one mod p. This is a very, this is like bread and butter of any number theory class that goes for more than about six weeks. You're going to be constantly talking about this because this is the accessible part, right? It leads to quadratic reciprocity, which is like the big theorem of undergraduate number theorem. Um, so anyway, it, it, it emphasizes that things are different modulo p. Right? You don't have to talk about complex number theory. Well, what's the solution to so there's lots more things you can do at the elementary level. I'm going to show you just a couple of them quickly. Primitive roots, the number of ways to write a number of a sum of squares, which is due to Marshall Hampton, who to my knowledge doesn't do anything else with number theory, but he just decided to write this one day. So you can get all way to write a number of a sum of two squares, not all of them, uh, and say Legendre symbols, modular solving of basic equations. And what I like to do is let people kind of experiment with pencil and paper. So if any of these things, primitive root, Two squares, is it prime? Is it a Legendre symbol? Um, any of those things, uh, I could just experiment with them. And so they'll do it like up to 11, and then I'll say, okay, well, what about you know 13? Right? So I can just use Sage to kind of verify the next thing. Instead of having them take more and more time, maybe he's thinking some basic arithmetic errors, they, they should work through those arithmetic errors. But I don't want them to keep on doing it through 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 uh, when it's a better use of our time once we're starting to see if there might be a pattern to get. Um, stuff there. By the way, uh, doobies to Sage, if you want to improve Sage pedagogically, there's still lots of room to do this. Someone just added the Jacobi symbol <coughs> to Sage. I asked for this because I was teaching, and for some reason there's the Kronecker symbol and there's a Legendre symbol, but there isn't the Jacobi symbol, which is 
basically in between those two in some sense. And uh, so this Taylor, I don't know how to say his last name, but it's French. Um, he made a patch and there was a lot of discussion about it. Uh, that I, and I convinced him to use the Kronecker symbol that's already in Sage to compute the Jacobi symbol instead of doing it by hand, which was fantastically <laughs> slow. And uh, anyway, so there you go. So 20 hours ago. Jerome de Meyer is about to merge it, I hope. Oh, he rebased it to 4.7. Mm -hmm. So Jaron is, or Yeru, sorry, is about to merge it, I hope. And so then I'll have Jacobi symbol next time. And I want to use the word chronic. So here's something else. Um, Min and wants to improve this solve modular function thing. Um, and uh, Doug McNeil has posted a patch, which I have not had time to review. Uh, on improvement. So this is just solving x squared plus 2 equals x and x squared plus y equals y squared mod 14 and it, it's pretty much brute force and he wants to change it to brute force plus Chinese remainder theorem uh, which would still be very slow of course but for a general thing. Um, you can do elementary cryptographic stuff easily too so I'm just going to pick a random prime again uh, and here I'm picking a mod primitive root for my Diffie Hellman just because I feel like it. Um, you don't have to and so here's another interesting function, random integer. Hey, rand int. Okay, well, that sounds pretty useful, right? So it's easy to find these guys. And here I, I'm just uh, showing up. Here's, so I didn't print out Q. Maybe I should print out Q. So I know, and I should print out P. And it's as easy as that to change things. And so I have a random prime. The primitive root is 2. And then uh, Alice is going to pick some number n. And she's going to send Q to the n to Bob. Mod P, of course. Bob's going to pick M and send Q to the M to Alice. Mod P. And then they're going to exponentiate to the other powers, and they'll get QMN equals QMM, which by commutativity is the same. And um, E, this dropper, uh, can't uh, find out what this key is, at least until I have lots of messages. I don't know if Eve Curry has ever gotten any jokes about cryptography. Ah, uh, Eva, that's true. So, it, so, <laughs> so, so not, not, not yet. Sorry, I don't know why I didn't pick that. When you say until they send lots of messages, are you referring to like? Oh, right. If they send a lot of messages, somebody could do some kind of cryptographic analysis of all the messages to break it. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter what the key is. If you send enough stuff, eventually, the code can be broken. That's what Joseph Silverman said the other night, at any rate, at our MLA yeah. banquet talk. Hmm. So, I don't buy that at all. Okay. Well, anyway, I mean, so you could be using what? this key as for like a it has to make that DSA. I mean, you're not saying how you're using the key in any. No, I'm not. That's true. Yeah. If yeah. you're using the key in a really stupid way, then that would be true. But yes, if you're if you're using this key in order to set the parameters for, um, like some sort of standard symmetric cipher. Then Even if there was a whole bunch of uh, yeah. crypto text that they that, that Eve was intercepting, well, just generally some, some, some attack. Part, part of the point of given that you have a certain amount of yeah. yeah. right. plain text. If right. you have some certain threshold of plain text and cipher text, then you might have some greater probability of right. Right. I'm, I'm so saying still, by, by lots, I mean lots. Yeah. Not just the, yeah. I mean, so you're saying that it would have plain text. You yeah, but I'm, he's not saying what he's doing. But no, I'm not. I mean, if you if you do what people do these days with the good symmetric ciphers, then I don't think you get. I mean, the amount of text you need is yeah, lots insane. I don't think it's. I don't know. I, I'm deliberately leaving that vague. <laughs> <laughs> but lots. I mean, do students? So every time I taught this a few weeks ago, and yeah, yeah. students always ask, "How are you actually encrypting the messages back and forth?" And then a typical answer you might say is something like, you use these numbers for a one-time pad or something like that. Or you... Right, right. Because that's a really easy thing no, to No, that's the best. I mean, yeah. And then, then you can only send... Then you can only send one number. Right. Yeah. You can only send one message. Right. Or you say something about using some standard symmetric cipher. Right. Um, and, and, and Sage does have... I, I don't know where it is exactly in the talk, but Sage does have um, like some pedagogical versions of like DES and AES. That's some serious um, versions of all this. It does, I, I don't well, know where library, those are. So there's I a library Pi called PyCrypto. Pi oh, Pi Crypto. okay. That, so and they're not pedagogical. They're no, serious. No, I'm talking about the Sage Crypto directory. Uh, I'm saying like yeah. written in Sage. Yeah. Simplified. DS, That's right. It's SDS, Simplified. Right, right, right. That's yeah, right. So. yeah. So I'm sure that Python has all kinds of libraries. Well, yeah. It's included in Sage's PyCrypto. Okay. And it's 
It's a good place to point students when That's they ask questions. No, no, I didn't know that. See, play crypto in I Sage, and it has it has implementations of all these. Like, so I, I will make sure to to look for that uh, when I get to that point in this talk. Yeah. Um, so, so I was going to say it's easy to find number theoretic functions that have completion, but we already talked a lot about things. Here's some advanced things uh, that you can come by. Just so you know, they're there. You can get fields uh, and various things about number fields. Um, and so it's just useful to know that you can do that. Uh, if you do have a two semester course or if you're teaching at a place that has the opportunity for something like that. Or if you have like an advanced student who wants to do an independent study. Uh, so it's nice to know that it's all kind of there with you. Uh, of course, there's these nice complex plots. Uh, I'll talk about the Riemann zeta function again in a little bit, but uh, it's always nice to know that we have these wonderful things. Thanks to Robert Bradshaw and Miller for this, I think. Robert Bradshaw wrote that. Yeah. So, which is really nice. Nice and sci-fi. So, so here's the, the so this is the uh, the basic pedagogical ones natively. Um, the high crypto module has serious versions. Is that correct? Yes. Absolutely. So here's a simplified DES, and it it's just encrypting it. I don't teach this stuff in my class, so that's all I have to say about it. But some of you might, like I say, especially if it's more computer oriented or more cryptography class. Uh, there was a great talk, uh, one of the MA things that went to recently about um, cryptography as kind of an intro to math type course, even for non majors and stuff. Okay. Now it's time to visualize mathematics. So, this is really the, the heart of my talk, but I wanted to kind of you know, introduce it with what you can do just without that. So, here's a way to use the some of the HTML uh, kind of stuff to just make it look a little nicer, a little uh, JS math. Let's look at all the powers of three module of the prime step. Then you can see that they seem to repeat. And now I can use an interactive thing to try a different uh, base. And they seem to repeat, but with a different period. And uh, then I can try five. Now it seems to repeat in a different way, uh, but it has the original period again, and now if I try six, it repeats, and it has a different period yet again, okay? So you, you can you can do something like this. And this is a nice way to make it uh, really easy for people to explore these kind of theorems. It's very similar to what Tom was saying in terms of looking for uh, patterns like this. In fact, it's pretty much identical to the thing that Tom was doing uh, because he was also doing groups of units. But I contend uh, that it's not quite as nice as this. But this, what this is, and there's some explanation in the text below. What I'm doing is I'm giving a color to each of the numbers mod seven. And unfortunately, we don't have good, I can't get the, the rows to number right. But the first, this top row is the row for one. The second row is a row for two, three, four, five, six. And then each column is these powers of one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this is the powers of two. Zero power is zero, and in fact, all the dark blue is zero. Okay, two to the one is two, so this is two, and you'll notice two only shows up in two places. Two to the first, and uh, sorry, uh, this is three, so three to three only shows up in three to the first, and five to the fifth. So those are the only two play ways you can get two, or three, in mod seven. And then here we have six, one, six, one, six, one. And so there's all kinds of theorems that we can see here. Here's Fermat's little theorem, because the six powers are all one. Here's what I like to call the square root of Fermat's little theorem, which is that all the p minus one over two powers are plus or minus one. Um, this is a, shows there's a primitive root, because all the colors are in this row. So that means that all, you get every number with a power. And of course, I could try and change that. So I'll try and pick another prime. So I'll do 11. And uh, hopefully that will come up in just a second. And so you could try and you know, show this graphic off number of times. And uh, hopefully the students can kind of visualize some of these theorems that we're trying to get them to understand. Uh, and of course now it's a little more complicated, so we have to kind of see what's still true, what's not true. And the more you do, the more theorems you can visualize. But I contend that the way, you, the right way to do it is to use just a little more programming to make an interactive version. So I go to 23 really easily and compare that with the version that I just saw with 7, um, whenever it shows up. Did you just give, these, give this interact to your students and say, what patterns do you notice in the picture? 
No, what I actually do is we start off by doing a couple of, by, what I usually do is start off by hand, where we kind of do some things by hand, and, you know, just pencil and paper or chalkboard or whatever, and they, they kind of try it out for five or 10 or 15 minutes, depending on what the concept is. Try to find it. One of the later ones is more like 15 minutes. And then I say, like, how do we, how can we organize this information? And here's a way to organize it. And, and they might not see patterns. You know, these are non-trivial theorems. They seem trivial because we've taught them so many times or because they're called little. Um, and, 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 they're, and they're not really, tri they're not non-trivial. They're, they're sorry, they're not trivial. They, um, they take a lot of work to even find in a lot of cases. And so being able to use this to, to kind of, I understand the concept that you might have. Uh, so for instance, I think this might be the first primitive root row for this prime. Um, you know, that, that's something where they can kind of start to see. And then I, what I'd actually then do is ask them to see if they can see other theorems. And that's the fun part. After we, we look for one, and uh, usually this is one that they find. Um, <laughs> so that, that's a nice one. But no, but it, it's an interesting thing because it doesn't really have a name, but it's still really cool. Important. So my contention is that this is the way you want to do it. And if you don't like these colors, you can change the color map. I had a colorblind student once, uh, so we could not use this color map. No problem, right? There's all kinds of grayscale. We had to do this here because of projector. It just didn't. This looked like a washout mess because all the blues looked the same, um, which is bad. See, I suppose you could do the same thing in group theory. And use yes. And in fact, there's an NSF funded thing at um, so. Salisbury University in Maryland uh, called Pascalwa, which is, is kind of like a combination of um, this kind of visualization, which I think I got from the Bursu Wagon book. Um, this kind of visualization and um, what do they call them? The things that Wolfram talks about all the time. The uh, demonstrations. No, 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 no. The, the probabilistic and cellular, cellular, cellular automata. automata. Yeah, yeah, the cellular automata. Science. Yes. <laughs> science. Yeah, yeah, science. Right, right, right. You know, so, the cell, so cellular automata plus group theory equals the Pascal Law project, which could be completely re-implemented in Sage if you want to. Um, and maybe that would be worthwhile for somebody who taught group theory. We should do cellular automata better than that. I, that, that would get a nice topic for you for this summer. Uh, so here's one that, that we definitely start by hand. Okay, this is one. Are the, when are there solutions to x squared congruent to minus one? And here I'm going to use the table command, which Jane has made a really nice um, worksheet on in our prep workshop. And so we do it by hand and try to see when is there a solution, when is it? And they can do this by hand, right? They just try all the squares and see if you get minus one. But it's a little harder to do that, you know when you start getting up to higher, it just takes a long time. And so I want to say, is there a pattern where they exist and where they don't exist? And actually, this is not so easy for the students to see right away. If you know the answer, it's easy. But they're kind of like, well, there's like eight heat, like there's some here, and there's more on this side, and they, which is, by the way, also an interesting thing. And then, well, it's eight, and then four, and then 12, and they're like, oh, wait, man. then I have to kind of maybe prompt them a little bit. Well, what do eight, four, and 12 have in common? You know, or something like that. But they start seeing, oh, so there, it's always some multiple of four here, and some multiple. But then they try to see if it's the same multiples of four, which of course doesn't happen. Um, and eventually they get to the idea, it's like, oh, it's the residue class mod four. That's what matters. And then we can try to prove this, right? Um, so it's a really powerful way to do this. And here I'm just using the table stuff. I'm not visualizing in a traditional sense, but it's updated immediately. And if I wanted to do up to 100, I could do that. Another thing that's really nice, the prime pi function, which uh, Andrew's been working on diligently wherever he is. Um, and so it comes with its own custom plotting method, uh, which is really nice. And what I like to do, and this is something that's typical to me, I think that not showing analytic number theory is not a good idea in undergraduate math, uh, number theory course, a full semester course. Number theory is a way for students to see that mathematics is a unified whole, which we do not have in many math curricula. It's a whole bunch of disjoint courses that all have the same flavor, but don't really have similar content. My contention is, and this is actually why I started doing this too, like Sage was almost like the bonus add-on that I could do it, uh, is that these things show that math is a unity. And so we start talking about analytic things. We, we prove some things about analytic number theory. We don't prove the prime number theorem. Uh, here you can see that uh, we already went out too far probably. Um, but you can see that the uh, prime counting function, which is the black spot, is very, very close to the log integral, which is the blue one. They're together, so they're purple. And then this is uh, x over the natural log of x. So 
but we'll return to that later. The point is we can see these things. All right, so um, one of the best things about this is illuminating proofs. So, so far it's just been showing data. How can we use SAGE to illuminate an otherwise obscure proof? Why do we even teach proofs? Why don't we just tell people, hey, here's this thing, we're going to take a day to, we could take a day to prove it, but you wouldn't remember the proof later, and uh, you know, you're not really going to learn anything from doing it, because we aren't going to use the techniques anywhere else. Right? Why do we do this? We want them to get a sense of the overall structure, I think. There are some students who will remember these things. But for most, it's like, well, what is proof? Why are we doing it? For a long, hard proof, can I make it through a detailed uh, set of ideas? Can I make it through that long train of logic? And I want to go even further and say, can I understand the main concept? And so I think that visualizing a proof of something like quadratic reciprocity uh, is a way to do that. So here's quadratic reciprocity. Uh, you have to know what a Legendre symbol is to understand this. But it's basically saying that the solutions to x squared congruent to p mod q are very closely related to the solutions of x squared congruent to q mod p. So mod p and mod q somehow have this uh, relationship, and this is the relationship. Um, and so the proof. Um, is one that I've actually used to use the traditional in every single textbook Gauss proof, uh, except I think that William has also a proof using uh, Gauss sums uh, in his book, but, and a few other books yeah, do that. But but I that's to me that that gets too hard, like complex. I, get, so, I have two proofs. Two proofs right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I have an easy one and a hard one. Right, and then I I avoid the hard one. Depending on what you know, the where it's easy and harder. But uh, yeah, so I assume my students don't know about much about complex the, sums. So. The Gauss sum one is concept, more conceptual. So this one uh, is from this article, Eisenstein's Misunderstood Geometric Proof uh, from CMJ. It's a great article if you haven't read it. Um, and so it's actually, I think, easier than the usual one that we have. So what I do is, uh, again, this is for the cognoscenti in some sense, you define this thing R, which is a sum of some floor functions, and that this is going to be an exponent of minus one. And we've already proved that Eisenstein, this criterion, which is not the Eisenstein criterion, <laughs> it's the criterion of Eisenstein, anyway. Um, and so it turns out that the Legendre symbol is minus one to this crazy power. And what I'm going to do is geometrically interpret these things just like you would as a traditional, um, the traditional proof of Gauss's. This is a really long interact. And so once it comes up, you can see that I have the picture that are in a lot of number theory textbooks, or at least a closely related one. But I've even done a little more. I've made a little sagey goodness with uh, some JS math to show exactly what the blue dots are representing. This is 7 times 2 over 11, floored. This is 7 over 4 times 4 over 11, floored. This is 7 over 6 uh, by 11, floored. 8 and 10. And then what does that simplify to? And I end up getting 17, which is 1 mod 2. And that's what I want. Right? I, I want the Le Johnson to be right. And so you can go through this in a book and a picture. Uh, picture in a book, and um, you can try to explain what the different pieces mean, but it's still somewhat hard for the students to understand, and then they tell like, well, look, this diagonal, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, you know, going through all the lattice points, and is it really just supposed to be by the lattice points, and trying to understand what the relevant variables are from one picture is really hard, and I know this because I've tried to understand them, and I basically had to make an interact like this to understand the proof, and if I have to, and my students are definitely going to have But instead, I said, well, let, let's take a look. What if I make P be something like 23? OK, all of a sudden now, it, it changes the way they're thinking about it, right? Now I, I don't have this nice symmetric picture, which is usually the one in the book, where it's close primes. You know, I, I, can, I can be very silly and uh, you know, be like 97, 23 or something. Um, right? So I mean, that one's a little harder to visualize, right? But, um, but, but they do like the idea that it's going to look the same. And then I can go through, and we can say, and then in the proof itself, I'm not going to take you through it, um, there's more pictures, which I'm not going to show you. They're going to kind of be like taking this guy and corresponding him to you know this guy over here, and they're going to take these two, and they're going to correspond to these two guys, and they're going to take these three and correspond to these three, and so on. They're going to be, but they can do it like that, and then I can change the size, and they can say, does that correspondence still hold? Not just in the one picture, but in all of them. Uh, so I really think that illuminating proofs using visualization is something that can be best done in an interactive environment, such as the interacts. Um, certainly, you could do this in other systems as well, um, but not as free.
Okay. So there's lots more math. And of course, having the math right inside of it. I talked about all this. Okay, so analytic number theory. Um, I'm almost out of time, so I'm, I'm going to uh, show, maybe this will be the last thing I show. I think this is another great place to look for this kind of stuff. Um, and here it's to kind of see, book, to believe what the books say. Because honestly, you know, analytic number theory is crazy because you have to get so big in order to have the theorems actually be true, right? It's like, you're, you're talking about limits. Yeah, so limits are big. Like, you go out to infinity. And, and so, you know, it's kind of hard to get there. Um, and, and so how do, you, how do you convince students that there's a chance this might actually be true and we're not just seeing some kind of uh, weird data? By the way, I'd love to be able to visualize um, the SKUs number, um, but somehow it, it Sage just doesn't have the power for me. Yet. <laughs> so if you're bored. If you're bored, <laughs> if you're bored, try and find a way to show where a log integral first dips below the prime. Um, so the Lejean, so I give some historical background, and um, then Gauss didn't tell anybody about his solution that, for over 50 years. Um, and then he does the log integral, and all that to say, um, I make this earlier graphic interactive. Okay? So now I have this, and I, now I can kind of say, I'll go out to 100, I'll go out to 1,000, and now you can see each time that x over ln x is becoming a worse and worse approximation compared to how good of an approximation the log integral is. Yes, John? Great. Yes. Uh, that, I think that's what I used as an undergrad. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's why I use as an undergrad too. I just changed a lot since I was an undergrad. But uh, one of the things I noticed was I, I thought the exposition of the primer was just awful. It's just kind of yes, it's just randomly placed in there. Yeah. I, you know, I can, and, yeah. So when, when I look at this, I mean, the thing that comes to mind when I look at this, and I don't know, maybe you said this earlier, I'm sorry. I was just, but when I see this, I was wondering, have you ever thought, I mean, one of the things we do, we teach in calculus, so, that's really big computer science, of course, is to compare how two functions grow. That's so, right, yes. So, so you mean O, oh, big O, and stuff like right. that. Exactly. Yes, yeah, I, we we don't do a lot with it, but we do introduce the concept. So, I mean, it's occurred to me that if you just look at x divided by pi of x, mm -hmm. and then ask the students what functions does that look like, so, they might be able to guess natural log of x by themselves. Yeah, I... And I was wondering, so I was just wondering if you tried that. Yes, I just didn't have time. I can't show you. But if you want, if you want more information, uh, you can go to the published worksheets at sage.math.org.edu, and uh, they're all there. <laughs> so, so you can you can search for uh, you can search for divide. And <laughs> did you do a worksheet for every day? Yes, that is why there is a book. Oh, right. right? <laughs> you, the, the sum totality of the worksheets is the book. Cool. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I'm not kidding. That I did. Saying, that, right? I'm way, not kidding. That's, that's, that's the way, that's the way books happen, happen, and that's not a bad way to do it. No, no. But he didn't write it in tech, right? He just wrote. No, I no, I did not write it in tech. I wrote it all in Sage, and then I used um, SWS2 tech turned into <laughs> tech files, which more or less look okay, except they don't do interacts. Okay, so the point is that I can I can do this, and then I can play around with some other stuff. So here, uh, that oh, so this shows the errors. Um, so I can kind of, you know, and I compute the errors, and you, they, you can see that the, you know, the individual errors are a lot better. Um, and, and then this one is going to compute something even cooler. I love this one because I'm computing the, the correct sum of log integrals that should approximate this even more. And, uh, and so you can see this blue line, uh, and I, I zoom in is really, really close, and so is the red line. Sometimes the blue line is closer, and sometimes the red line is closer. In fact, right now, the red line is better, which is not true in the long run, I think. But, uh, and then I can add you know, more to the, the sum. And so they're seeing just how much better these extra approximations are. Now, granted, now they're not proving anything with this. right? At this point, it's just eye candy and getting them excited. But they're getting excited about math. right? There's cool theorems out there. And even if they can't touch them in the last few weeks of class, that's OK, because I've assigned them a take-home project that they don't want to have homework for you know, in addition to anyway. right? So they, they do the take-home project at night, and then during the class day, they, they 